Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Troubling Tribune. I'm your host, Skylar Moody, and today we have a special presentation for you. Now, unless you've been living under a rock, you've probably heard the news that the long-standing precedent of law has been overturned, Roe v. Wade, that had guaranteed women the right to an abortion. Now, there's a lot of mixed opinions on this issue. It seems like it's a very split aisle. Um, and so in light of that, I did watch a documentary that released over the weekend over at the Daily Wire. I'll go ahead and save the title for the end, but here are a few clips from the documentary. I hope you enjoy. Unfortunately, those roots of eugenics, it really has borne fruit. African-American women, we are three times more likely to abort than other races. And we have abortion as the number one cause of death in our community. And it's truly devastating. Targeting minorities is systemic in the entire industry. We were told that we were to go into minority neighborhoods, low-income neighborhoods. We were to put up flyers about the abortion services to essentially lure these minority women into our facilities. What has happened to African-American communities as a result of Margaret Sanger's plan to interject abortion in a very vulnerable, poor community has unraveled our family life. Most people don't appreciate that by the 60s, black family life was still relatively healthy. 78% of black husbands were in their homes with their wives raising children. You fast forward after they interjected welfare state policies and abortion, now we're looking at 75% of black children born outside of marriage. The low educational rates, the, 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 the high crime rates, the abortion rates, the welfare rates, the AIDS rates, everything ill is hitting this particular population simply because of Margaret Sanger's plan to annihilate this population, their families, and make sure that they did not have success in this country. Roe had made all of these promises that, you know, if you allow abortion, if you legalize abortion, then, you know, domestic violence is going to decrease, that uh, poverty is going to decrease, that, you know, all of these societal ills are going to essentially go away if you allow women to kill their children. And none of those things have gotten any better. In fact, they've gotten worse. You know, I think about just the eight years that I was at Planned Parenthood and during that time, you know, I definitely would have called myself, a, you know, a feminist and, you know, a, a champion of women. There is not one time in that eight years where a woman came to me for help, where I sat down across from her and I said, you know, I'm going to help you today. At Planned Parenthood, we were to turn every telephone call and every client visit into a revenue generating visit. We didn't provide prenatal care. We don't get kickbacks if a woman chooses adoption. So the only way that we can make money on a pregnant woman is to sell her an abortion. And so you basically get a woman into the facility and you wreck her plan. You're really not strong enough to do that. You're not strong enough to be a single mom. You're not strong enough to meet your educational goals. You're not strong enough to meet your career goals. So I'm gonna take advantage of your vulnerability and I'm gonna convince you to give me money to kill your baby. That's not strength. That's not giving her resources. That's really the opposite of what feminism is. And so I guess the question then becomes, why isn't Planned Parenthood doing that? Because they're an abortion empire. It's $1.7 billion corporation. And they're selling abortion. They're literally profiting off of the deaths of children and the pain, some of the most painful moments of a woman's life. I think that the pro-death community has always used women for their own purposes. I think that they use anyone for their own purposes. When I was first deep diving of the abortion industry, researching it, I came across a book called Lime Five by Mark Kretcher. And this book was basically a compendium of all of these different cases of sexual abuse cover up at abortion clinics, abuse of women at abortion clinics, um, abortionists just committing 
horrible illegal activity, unethical activity that he had painstakingly documented over a period of two decades. And that was when I started to think, can we document this happening in Los Angeles? Because I was a college student um, in, in LA. Can we document this at the abortion clinics here? Is it happening here? And that inspired our first investigative report. I wanted to test Mark's theory that he had, that abortion is, uh, sexual abuse is covered up in abortion clinics across the country. So I went into two abortion clinics in Los Angeles, two Planned Parenthoods, posing as an underage girl with a much older boyfriend. She said, okay, I'm you know 15 years old, he's much older, he's 23. This is a clear case of statutory rape in California. What do I do? And the first Planned Parenthood clinic I walked into, one in Santa Monica, told me that I should change my age on the paperwork so that it would not trigger reporting and I could get a secret abortion. And then the second abortion clinic I went into in Los Angeles, same thing. They said that they were not gonna report anything. And she sat there persuading me to have an abortion. If we keep this conversation, I'm gonna have to talk to my manager. And yeah, he's gonna get in trouble. But in order to get the, I'm not gonna tell anybody. Well, you know, yeah, he's over such and such and you can do statutory rape and whatever. But it's going to be in the papers, so most people will threaten stuff and don't go through with it. Okay. I don't care. I'll leave it. It's, uh, you know, how they essentially keep the doors open. You know, Planned Parenthood parades around as this great benefactor to the masses, but they are looking for the most effective ways to make money. The supposedly pro-women organization, Planned Parenthood, is actually covering up the sexual abuse of little girls. And these girls are being taken by their abusers or sent by their abusers for secret abortions and then sent back to their abusers. And the one person who's supposed to intervene, a health professional, and make a report and, and trigger the steps for rescuing that girl and helping her, intervening, is, is not only not doing their job, they're actively participating in the abuse. You know, I, I remember a telling phone call with a detective from the LA Police Department working on child sexual abuse cases. And he said in all his years, his decades working in LAPD, he'd never gotten a phone call from an abortion clinic. No abortion clinic had ever reported suspected abuse when they're the ones dealing with pregnant girls, young girls who are involved in sexual activity, and instead of flagging, oh, is there an older guy involved? What's your situation? Is there abuse going on? They just sell an abortion and send her on her way. And this kind of goes back to one of the major lies that Nathanson and, and his pro-abortion colleagues told, which was that legal abortion is good for women. Abortion is a solution to women's problems. Uh, women will be safer, their health will be better if they can access abortion. This is simply not true. There are serious risks of abortion to women. And even in cases where there aren't kind of health side effects, psychological side effects, long-term consequences, uh, women are actually not better off if their best solution is to kill their child, right? It, it pits women against their own children. It turns their the, that most vulnerable human relationship into an antagonistic relationship between enemies, and women are not better off as a result of that. Early in my career, I was an abortionist. I performed over 700 abortions. That went on for about a year and a half, and um, it all came to a, a halt on a Saturday morning. I remember it so well. I was doing abortions. Um, we would do 20, 25 abortions on a Saturday morning. And the last patient of that day was a little 16-year-old. And usually when we do an abortion, um, up to, and we were only doing them up to about 13 weeks at that time, uh, there's only a tablespoon, maybe three or four tablespoons of amniotic fluid that come out when we uh, do the procedure. This was different. Uh, there was probably a quart, maybe a quart and a half of amniotic fluid that came out uh, as I was doing it. And uh, then the, uh, there was a lot of blood. And then it happened, uh, the event that changed everything. Uh, the baby kicked me. Now you might think, here I was doing abortions for 
a year and a half, and I would see the products that I was pulling out of the uterus, the broken limbs, the torsos, the, the head, all the pieces of those babies. And that didn't really move me. It didn't change my mind. And it was only then when I examined the abdomen and realized that this pregnancy was much further along than I had anticipated. It, it, it really hit home, I think, with a, uh, the fact that I was taking a life. She had to be taken to the hospital and um, removed, the baby was removed in pieces and a gruesome procedure. That was the last abortion that I ever did. Um, they use language such as just throw it away. Throw, you know, flush it down the toilet. I mean, there is just, there is complete disregard and disrespect for the unborn child and they go out of their way to misinform and, and sideline the facts and the science that demonstrate that this is a real human being that is, if you go through with this, you will be killing an innocent life. Because in Planned Parenthood's ideology, an abortion is always best. It doesn't matter your situation. If you're poor, if you're raped, if you're abused, abortion is your ticket. And that's our job. We wash our hands of caring for you afterwards. And that's what's happening in Washington, D.C. right now. The case of brave pro-life activists who intercepted bodies of 115 children outside Cesare Santangelo's abortion clinic. And is anyone investigating? Has DC police, when, when the bodies of these infants were found outside his abortion clinic, including the bodies of five babies who looked to be, some of them nearly full term, five babies who were between 20 to 40 weeks old, one little girl whose neck was cut and her brain removed, another baby born in Cal in the amniotic fluid sac, two babies that were viciously dismembered, babies maybe 28, 30 weeks old, and then another little baby boy who looked to be full term according to some medical experts. No signs of apparent trauma on his body. How did he die? How did he die? Was he did, was he delivered alive, like Cesare Santangelo has admitted he would do, and then drowned or just left to die? These are the questions that law enforcement should be investigating, and yet they are not. Who would have guessed 50 years ago when people were promising the courts resolve this question? Or people now saying, oh, settle the law. But actually, the political alignment of the entire country is not built around a war and peace. It's not built around the size of the welfare state or tax policy. Everybody has opinions. But on life, it's like the Red Sea. I think that tells us something. We need a better answer than the one we've got now. People often say to me, well, Claire, don't you don't you think women should should have the right to choose what they do with their own body? And, and I always say, yeah, absolutely, I do. But the problem here is that I wasn't my birth mother's body. There is a separate human being inside of my birth mother's body, and that was me. And so women, yes, absolutely, they should have the right to do what they want with their body, but not when it's at the expense or the death of a child like me, like my twin. Well, folks, that was some, some truly compelling stuff. Now, I don't know about you, but over here at the Troubling Tribune, we do take a pro-life position. It has nothing to do with political affiliation or anything like that. It's simply where the science has led us. Now, there are a lot more great points to be seen in that documentary. It is called Roe v. Wade, The Legacy of Death. You can find it over at thedailywire.com. I recommend everybody go and watch it. Um, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Please like and subscribe and share this video. There's a lot of really good information that um, it's kind of hard to get out of the echo chamber. So, uh, if you would, uh, feel free to help us with that endeavor. As always, I wish you all a wonderful one until next time.